Hello, random stranger. If you are up for more confronting questions about human civilization and the beauty of mortality, then you have come to the right place. We are going to be watching episode two of Girls Last Tour. Uh, but first, we are going to be addressing some issues or questions that were raised in the first episode. Remember, if you just want to skip straight to the reaction, there are timestamps down below. The foremost question in my mind after episode one was, when is this set exactly? How far into the post-apocalyptic future are Chi and Yu? There's no clear answer so far, and it has only been one episode, but we do have quite a mixed bag of clues that puts an intriguing twist on that question, even as it makes it more difficult to come up with an answer or like deduce a specific time period. It is possible, and I sense this when I watch the show, that the creators maybe don't want us to determine uh, a watertight time period. Maybe the key focus is more on dwelling on the bigger issues like why do humans wage war and what does it mean to live and how do you face death. So maybe the show itself is just one long letter to the rest of us humans to know mono no ware or develop this sensitivity to the impermanence of things, which someone in the comments brought up and which we'll get more into later because it's a fascinating concept that I have come across in Hoseki no Kuni and even in Kayon but seems to be something that Girls Last Tour is very much about expressing. Uh, nevertheless, we are going to dive into the thought process of trying to figure out what time period this is anyway, because I think it takes us through some interesting aspects of the show, even if there is no ultimate answer. First off, without knowing anything about the show, you notice immediately the predominance of World War I, World War II era equipment, uh, and not just the equipment, but the clothing and the weapons. And if you really want to get specific, uh, you can thank Eccles Ezekiel in the comments, who helpfully wrote that you is carrying a Japanese World War II rifle. The plane is a Russian Tu-95 bomber, which actually was first flown uh, a few years after World War II ended. And then there's the Browning M2 machine gun, which was designed by an American towards the end of World War I and was very, very heavily used in World War II. And just to make sure that another major player in World War II didn't get left out, um, thank you, David Myford, for pointing out that the girls are driving a German Kettenkrad, uh, which is sort of an ideal post-apocalyptic vehicle because I guess it's more manageable than, say, a huge military truck. And uh, it provides all-terrain load-carrying capabilities and can be driven like a motorbike, but without the issues associated with keeping it upright. Uh, so, normally a plethora of leftover World War II stuff would suggest that it's not that far into the future, especially because in Chi's dream or nightmare or flashback, whatever war was going on then also didn't seem to be fought using futuristic weapons at all. From innumerable sci-fi works set at least a few hundred or a few thousand years into the future, I think you'd expect things like uh, droids and phaser guns and proto-molecule bioweapons, just a lot more tech-heavy stuff and not the same old tanks and rifles that were used in World War II. And so at first I thought that this might have been set in the past, but that this is an alternative future where after World War II, human civilization just devoured itself and collapsed due to nuclear wipeout or famine or disease or something. But then when we spend more time with Chi and Yu, you realize that there are these cultural and social disconnects that suggest they exist in a period that is set way into the future. For example, while both Chi and you know about guns and rifles and tanks, they have little to no understanding of what those were used for, like that universal human concept 
of war, they talk about not understanding why the people back then fought those wars as if those wars happened a long, long time ago, sort of like how we would talk about Alexander the Great and all of the wars that he fought against the Persians. Now, this lack of understanding may just be the result of being orphaned at such a young age because the flashback shows that there was a war going on when the girls were sent away, like a few years ago, being fought with old weapons. The problem is you also get things like when they come across the ruins of a fighter plane And Chi says that, oh, planes flew a long, long time ago. Which again suggests setting that's way into the future. There's also these like other little signs, like when they're talking about why it is that they ended up in the cave in the first place. And there's a flashback to you saying, isn't there an old saying, I wish I could just climb into a hole? And Chi asks, well, did they mean that literally? Referring to the very common saying that we have now, like referring to embarrassment that's so severe that you want to climb into a hole. But the two girls are speaking as though the humans who used to use that saying lived a really long time ago. Uh, There are also other signs that this is set sometime way into the future, uh, which Tom Leet talked about. Uh, So while all of the military equipment is clearly World War II era stuff, the world of Girls Last Tour defies being slotted into that specific period. It strikes me as being a future world because it is so industrialized and utilitarian. Everything is hard. Pipes, metal sheeting, big industrial buildings. Nothing is for pleasure. The only soft thing in the entire world is the snow. It's as if humanity went through an extended period of decline where we couldn't afford to spend our time on pleasure. So everything had to be purposeful. And then at the end of this, we engaged in a final war of annihilation. Yeah, I found that to be a very interesting idea that there was this prolonged period of civilizational decline. And then one last final war to end all wars was fought it would actually explain why the girls are surrounded by old machines and weapons and have yet never seen a flying plane or even know that planes could fly or even know about chocolate despite this um lack of general political or historical knowledge chi and you are very resourceful Like, Yu is extremely competent with the rifle, maybe just a tad too competent. Chi knows how to operate the cutting card, and when they're trying to find their way out of that cave, she uses Yu's saliva on her finger to feel the breeze and then find the exit. They have survived for this long, and so you know they've got some pretty decent skills. Uh, On that scene where they finally get out of the cave, Pirame made a pretty interesting point of analysis about when she says their eyes have adapted to the darkness uh, and a possible interpretation being that they've adapted to the darkness of their world, which is full of war, death and destruction. Um, and An interpretation that I really like because these girls know nothing about the beauty of the world that used to exist, which might be the one that we are inhabiting right now in the present. And one of my favorite shots was when they were just about to exit the cavern and they have to shut their eyes because the night sky is too blinding. And going along the lines of Pyramid's interpretation, it shows how bleak this world is if even the light of the night sky was too much for them after having been in that cave. It's going to take them some time to discover or get used to the light, or metaphorically, the idea that life can be beautiful, assuming that there is any beauty for them left to discover in this world. Another interesting thing that Pyramid noted was the nature of the physical contact between the two girls. So when Yu touches Chi, it's mostly to hug or to grab her affectionately, but when Chi touches Yu, it's usually to hit her or be violent towards her. And I was thinking about this, I'm not sure exactly what that might point to yet. We know there's a huge contrast in their characters. Um, 
to put it simplistically, you is the optimist and then she is the realist slash pessimist. And of course, um, as is shown by that scene, which we'll talk about later, there's a lot more to it than that. And I think we're going to discover the layers of their characters, hopefully, as the episodes go on. But Chi is definitely the deeper thinker of the two. They're both probably struggling with PTSD from the war and maybe even the family that they left behind at such a young age, even if they themselves don't know it. But it was interesting that we do see the scars of that war when Chi wakes up from the flashback with tears in her eyes. So yeah, these kids are scarred in more ways than one. Which brings us to that scene. We had a great chat about it in Discord, uh, which helped me think through what the heck is going on when Yu pulls a rifle on Chi over that last piece of chocolate. And I concluded that it's complicated. <laughs> there are, I think, several psychological causes and triggers that are equally plausible, if not working together to create this bizarre situation. First off, um, the setup to that scene is found in the conversations that happened before. The first was Chi's statement to you that she doesn't need a weapon to survive. It doesn't matter that she's not good at shooting, um, which ends up biting her in the butt later. And then the next little bit was when you and Chi are talking about what war means. Like, it means people kill each other, right? But why do they kill each other? It's because if there's more people than there are pieces of food, you've got to pick up a weapon and you've got to fight for it. That's how it's always been. And then in that lead up as well, there was a fascinating camera choice that maybe foreshadowed what was coming next. So when Chi is pulling you up to get onto the plane, like helping her get up, the camera focused solely on Yu's rifle that's slung across her back and which she uses later to assert her dominance over Chi. Just a, like a little ironic nod to how this moment of cooperation will be short-lived and it'll be just minutes later that the girls, well, one of the girls seemingly wants to kill the other. Okay, so the moment when you pulls the rifle on Chi. First off, I want to say hats off to whoever did the musical score for this because as soon as you uh, points the rifle, there's this um, very dissonant track that plays immediately and then you get this irregular beat that mimics an erratic heartbeat and that's when the realization dawns on Chi who says oh I see I guess I should have carried a weapon too so there are three things I gathered from re-watching it and then reading through all of your comments uh, that might possibly be going on here number one Broadly, this act is an extension of how unmoored both the girls are from any knowledge of human behavioral standards because of how young they were when they were orphaned. It's actually quite logical to go from, well, why did humans kill each other again? to, oh, if I threaten to kill you now, I actually get what I want. They are learning in real time what it means to be human and what is or isn't acceptable in human society, which doesn't exist anymore. And they are only at the very beginning of that journey. And you can tell from the shock on Chi's face that this is the first time that you, that you has pulled that shit. The second thing uh, was mentioned by Egg, Egg on Head, which is a great name. So they wrote... I think Yuri was basically playing war. They just discussed the topic, but actions speak louder than words, especially for you. So why don't we go and try it for ourselves? Yeah, agreed. It's it's the learning in real time. Like, why not try out for yourself what it feels like to threaten to shoot someone? Because that's what humans used to do. And they must have done it for a good reason. Otherwise, why would they have done it, right? I feel like the girls just haven't gotten to the point where they realize oh, past humans did a lot of stupid shit for a lot of stupid reasons and there are certain things that we should never learn from them and never do again. Uh, 
There was also another comment from Dan. Yeah, so there's also another reading of this scene, possible reading, which is that you was probably making the point that Chi is wrong to ignore the importance of using weapons to defend yourself. And of course, she made the point in a way that was uh, completely devoid of any awareness that it's dangerous, but she does get her point across. And yeah, once she's proven it, she's back to being her usual, normal, happy self. Also, I guess there's like a fourth less probable possibility, and that is that you is just a little psychopath in the making. Um, who knows? I guess we'll see. The last thing to note, and something that Asteraitis mentioned, which I find fascinating and I'm still learning about, is how the series leans heavily into this whole concept of mono no aware, variously translated as the impermanence of things or the honest of things. Uh, so in Girls Last Tour, it would be like surveying the bleakness of this seemingly dead, weapons littered landscape and discovering a certain beauty or calmness in it. Uh, it's about looking at the things that were, appreciating the here and now. And it's something that is felt in the soul and ostensibly, well, ironically, can't be described in words, which is what I'm trying to do now. Another way that I've seen it put is that it is a deep, gentle awareness or sadness of things. And I think the way that uh, Hoffertel commented about how Girls Last Tour feels simultaneously calm and ominous fits really well with this concept of mono no aware. Uh, a vehicle through which to contemplate mono no aware is through seeming contrasts. For example, the exquisite music that is used when the girls are looking out at this graveyard of weapons, contemplating the bleakness of war and of the destruction of human civilization beneath a beautiful blanket of stars, uh, like cute blobby girls supporting each other one second and then pointing rifles at each other the next. It's this placement of things and people that makes you realize that existence is transitory and that there is no joy that is not also tainted by the pain that comes with mortality but also that in that pain lies the seeds of beauty and of acceptance all right which leads us to episode two of girls last tour uh, if you guys are ready to go, let's do this in three, two, one, play. <laughs> Just making a snowman on the cut and crud. She's going to start a snow fight, isn't she? They probably are. Oh, man, again, there's beautiful music. Maybe they are already dead and they just don't know it yet. <laughs> I honestly wouldn't be surprised if that's the twist. Killjoy. It's so dark. And the music is so bright. They're going to freeze to death. <laughs> what? This is way too happy. <laughs> I mean, I guess there you go. There's another contrast. This is so cute. 
Like very slice of life OP. <laughs> they're marching, they're so cute while they're shooting rifles. This is, <sighs> oh, what does that mean? That symbol, that swirly symbol. Yeah, I was going to say, this is so disorienting. They're like driving a military motorbike. They're shooting rifles. There's ruins everywhere and that this song is so joyful. <laughs> I hope they're singing this too. If they are, they have great voices. Huh. And then, yeah, here we are back to this blizzard. The threat of freezing to death hanging over their heads. Can't fall asleep. It's another cave. Hmm, looks like a monument. Like the UN building, maybe. No, it just looks like just more pipes. A power plant. Okay, so they can't read. Oh, they actually found heat. Like a nice. We got steam. Um. I love that that's her first go-to solution. Just shoot it. Oh my god, I thought the, the ricochet was gonna like kill Chi or something. I'm just always expecting the worst. She's still trying. This is the most beautiful music I've ever heard set to a rifle shot. <laughs> oh, nice. Onsen. Uh, it'd be such a luxury given the conditions that they've been surviving in. <laughs> So after she shoots, she's like, okay, I've done my part. I don't know what else to do now. <laughs> Shooting is all she knows. Oh, this is nice. I wonder how long since it's been the last bath that they've had. I mean, they know the concept of bathing.
<laughs> so blobby. <laughs> I love the little piece of hair that sticks out on Yu's head. Okay, fourth. Ah, uh, it's paradise amidst the devastation. <laughs> I do like these little mentions of the afterlife. I mean, what does come after life? Is it the hellish landscape that they've been roaming around in or is it something better maybe there's nothing at the end i just for a second it looked like there were these frozen black clouds above Oh, that's an interesting script. It sort of looks like Japanese hiragana, sort of. Just very blocky. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, I own the brains, you're the brawn. Yeah, see, so again, this must be set way into the future because she can read and write this language, but not the old, you know, earth language. You gotta record history. I mean, they have forgotten a lot though. It's such a you thing to say. So you use more of a live in the moment kind of person. There's no use for the past or the future. Hmm. The thing is, I wonder how much has been lost. Grandpa? Wait, are these girls related? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> oh no, she's going to throw the book in. Oh. Oh, okay. She was expecting that. No. Oh. <laughs> oh no, she wasn't meant to do that. <laughs> Uh, she looked just so uninterested in what she was saying about books and the knowledge that are kept in them. <laughs> yep. Oh, God. That face, though. Man, I am totally on Chi's side on this. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh man, that yeah. Only four books left and one of them's half burnt now. You's just processing. <laughs> if 
Is she actually thinking about what she did? Is she gonna read him or is she gonna dump him in the fire to keep it going? She does have a sensibility despite appearances. Oh, another beautiful shot. Oh, she cares. <laughs> she looks so sad. Oh. I love that reflection of Chi and Yu's eyes. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe she's trying to just express how sorry she was. <laughs> oh, so sweet. And she liked it. There's that smile, that very rare smile from Chi. Okay, if they're not related, that kind of felt a little bit romantic-y. That was nice. <laughs> she tried. I'm <laughs> sucky. So oh man, that was nice. More moments like that, please. Oh, that's some kind of dam. Hmm. I wonder if Chi got all of her knowledge about this stuff from her grandpa's books. Or his journals? You really get a sense of the scale of these buildings. Um, They're so small. Yeah, man, wet shoes can kill you in like survivalist mode. Oh, it's like they're walking on water. Or in the sky. Hmm. 
you know, it's disorienting, like what is up and what is down. <laughs> okay, let's see how they do this. So smart. Very cautious. But the rope is just tying them two together. What if they both get washed away? <laughs> That age-old question. Oh, there's no ocean. They don't have a concept of ocean. Man, what do the humans do to the earth? It's that brawn over brain. Ah. <laughs> How are they going to cook it? I guess I could boil it back at that place. Oh my god, they don't know what a fish is. Damn, raised on rations. Oh, nature. Oh, we'll always outlast the humans. Sashimi it. Oh god, it's probably full of toxins. <laughs> Oh, look at that little island they've got. I mean, minus the apocalypse, this could be a nice little holiday. I don't know about the taste. It's probably like sewerage fish. <laughs> okay, I'm glad they're sharing food now and not pointing at like rifles at each other. <laughs> so that's a clean bone. <laughs> that's so weird. I love it. A higher level? Oh, is what another upbeat? ED 
Whoa. <laughs> this is so messing with my mind, mate. I really like the sketchy nature of like the illustrations. They're definitely singing this. It matches their speaking voices. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, what a bop. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh man, this is like beach trip, summer times. Just good feeling kind of song. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so random. Okay. Uh, immediate feelings about this episode. Now that I'm thinking about Mono no Ware and sort of looking for the beauty and the transience of things or in the death and destruction that is actually all around the girls, but not really in your face. You definitely notice more how the show uses the set designs to draw out those types of reflections. I, I really enjoyed the conversation that she and you had around books and the importance of recording history so that knowledge can be passed down to future generations. Ironically, all the while, reality for them is that there are probably no future generations to pass that knowledge down to and the knowledge that came before them has been pretty much lost. You, on the other hand, while Chi is going on about the importance of record keeping, is just loading up a rifle and playing around with the bullet pellets and says something like, memories just get in the way of living. There's such a stark contrast between the two very different values and approaches to what's important in life and what you should be spending your time on and they're probably both right and both wrong at the same time for example i actually kind of get why you threw the book in the fire even though i winced at it because i love books but at that point in time it is a source of fuel they do need the warmth and then you do need to keep the fire going. It's just something that's practical that will help them survive in that moment. On the other hand, knowing your history and knowledge is also very important. So I'm a little bit torn. Uh, they also mentioned Chi's grandpa. Um, I don't know actually if they share the same grandpa uh, and how he used to have so many books, which have been whittled down to like the four, I think that Chi possesses or maybe the three and a half now after you burnt one. So it seems that she did get most of, if not all of her um, knowledge about the world from those books. Obviously, she has a very incomplete account of what happened in the past as, you know, things tend to go when civilization ends in all out war. Other things like enjoying the simple pleasure of a hot bath in another one of those industrial looking wastelands and uh, catching a fish that tastes not half bad in what looks like a massive industrial dam. The episode just felt like a meandering few days where the girls discover hidden gems in the most punishing of landscapes and I was actually very happy for them and it just felt nice going along with them. It was also interesting their mentions of the afterlife and I couldn't help but feel like this environment is probably what the afterlife is like. <laughs> they are already there experiencing a version of an afterlife where there is nothing and no one except for each other, which is depressing when you think about it, but also, I guess, again, applying the mononoa water principle. 
there is a certain um, melancholic beauty in that. We also got more insights into the girls' relationship with each other, which I am very interested in digging more into. So you, while not being the sharpest tool in the box, is sensitive to what she feels and values. And I love that she kept asking if she was mad, if she was mad. And even though she may not agree 100% of the time with what she says, she's still capable of drawing a very cute, um, socky or sorry apology uh, in Cheese Journal, which I thought was very cute. All in all, I'm very much enjoying the slow pacedness of these episodes. There's a lot to think about, even though they are short. And it's just one of those shows where you have to rewatch the episodes to catch more detail in both the dialogue and also the art. And so I'll be very interested in seeing what you guys thought. Uh, until the next episode, thank you guys for watching with me and uh, we'll talk soon.